So you may have heard the phrase one flow per object, but is this rule still relevant? We all know that Salesforce loves to change things up and over time, this message too has changed. Now, new features have been added that gives you more options when making decisions related to your org. There are many factors to consider, all in the context of your own org and business processes. So that leaves us with the main question. Is it really a case of one flow to rule them all? Well, with the help of flow connoisseur Tim Combridge, who wrote the brilliant accompanying article to the video, we're going to explore some rules of thumb for this step of mastering your flow journey. Let's get into it. Now, we'd like you to remember that every org is different. Dependencies like industry, products, and licenses all have limitations and guidelines when it comes to flow. So keep that in mind throughout this video. Anyway, there are two questions that often get confused but should be answered separately when making decisions. One, how many flows can one object have? And two, how many flows should one object have? Some people will be seeking answers to the first question. Pause there, as this is the wrong question to ask. The aim is not to overload each object with as many flows as possible. To maximize your Salesforce org, you need to be smart about how you design each flow and consolidate as much as possible. Before we continue, this video will specifically refer to record triggered flows. If you're still unsure on the flow types, be sure to check out our ultimate guide to Salesforce flow video by our technical instructor, Andrew. Right, back to the video. Thanks, Ben. Salesforce originally advised that customers should design their automation with one flow per object. This was in the early days when Process Builder was still around and there was only one method of ensuring that your operations took place in the correct order and that's by structuring them inside of a single flow or process. Since the Spring 22 release in early 2022 and the introduction of the trigger order functionality, the ability to manage the order in which actions occur is no longer restricted to a single flow. The confusion grew when Salesforce announced that Process Builder and Workflow rules would be retired in favor of Flow. Legacy customers who had been around for a long time and hadn't had much access to Flow before started digging into the different features of the tool and wondering how best to implement it, as the guidance was changing and unclear. Salesforce changed their message when it became apparent that the advice couldn't be as clear cut. Instead, it had to take the customer's wider context into consideration. Imagine if Salesforce had said, hey, these tools that have been around for a long time that you build your entire Salesforce orgs on, they're not gonna work by the end of the year. That would have been a hard pill to swallow. Technically speaking, it's not possible to create just one record triggered flow per object. You may have a number of actions that need to be executed before the database is updated and others that need to be run after. Your record triggered flows can only run in one of the two contexts. So you may need to create a before flow and an after flow to satisfy your business needs. On the same note, record triggered flows can be triggered either on create, update, create or update, or delete. You can configure your before and after flows to be executed on create or update, but delete needs to be handled separately again. This means that ultimately, the magic number of flows per object is three. Before create or update, after create or update, or before delete. Before we go any further, I'd like to say a big thank you to this video's sponsor, Pipe Launch. Have you struggled to get your users to adopt Salesforce? Are they complaining about lack of data and no real reason to log in every day? Pipe Launch enriches your data, connects to LinkedIn, and provides automatic insights about each company in your org. Try it out with a free trial at salesforceben.com forward slash data. Salesforce's message has become increasingly blurry as they've released tools like Migrate to Flow, that create multiple smaller record triggered flows, one for each legacy automation that you previously had. If you have an org with one process per object and five workflow rules, this will translate to six new flows, one for the process and five for the workflow rules. You could definitely say that this has been causing some confusion. Admins are given the power to create flows, but there's not much guidance on how to maintain them or best manage them without further investigation. As a result of this, two main methods of record triggered flow design have risen from these new tools and the conversations surrounding flow best practices. Let's go into each of them, making sure to remember that once again, different dependencies will dictate what is best for you and your org. So the first option is working with multiple smaller flows with entry criteria. 
The more recent enhancements to the flow tool lead to an entirely new method of design when building out your record triggered flows. Utilizing the flow entry criteria functionality in conjunction with Flow Trigger Explorer to create multiple smaller flows that only contain a small amount of functionality and only a specific set of records will trigger it to run. To get a better view of this option, let's evaluate the pros and cons. So the pros are, number one, that your flows are going to be smaller and easier to read and much easier to update if you need to make a change because it will be significantly easier to find the area of your flow that you need to make the changes to. And number two, you can also rearrange the order in which your flows trigger for a specific object much easier due to the new drag and drop functionality. The system will also see performance improvements, particularly in orgs with large data volumes, as not every flow will be loaded into memory with every single record action, only those where the entry criteria are met. However, on the other side, the cons of this approach are, number one, if you experience a bug or have inherited a lot of record triggered flows, you'll need to search and dig through multiple record triggered flows to figure out where the issue is being caused. And number two, then of course, there are the limitations. For example, professional and essentials editions of Salesforce are only allowed five active flows at any one time. This means that if they have an autoresponder email flow for the leads object, an autoresponder email flow for cases, and a welcome email automation for new contacts, then there are only two more record triggered flows can be created for the entire org. That's not a lot. Now that we've explored the first option and its pros and cons, let's take a look at option number two. I call it the rule of three. First, let's start by explaining what the rule of three actually means. Remember earlier when we learned that there are three different types of record triggered flows? Well, this is where the rule of three comes into play. If you are looking to group your flow functionality together into as few flows as possible, then you can group it together and slot it in either before your creation or update, after your creation or update, or before your deletion. That being said, you don't need to create three flows per object. You should design according to your business requirements. Now, when we talk about designing according to your business requirements, this could mean a couple of things. If you're a smaller organization and you can fit it all inside one flow for that object, then do try to fit everything for that object inside of a single flow. There's no need to create the other two if you don't need them. If you're starting in a fresh org, start with no more than three flows per object. A single before update, an after update, and a delete flow for each object. You can't actually have one flow per object like the old process builder days. It's extremely improbable because you're likely to need a before, an after, and a delete flow, which all have to be separate flows. You can't just have all of that in one flow that handles all three scenarios and branches accordingly. The flow will only be triggered in one of those three contexts. So you start designing with those foundational three flows per object, the before, the after, and the delete. Why would you need more than these for each object? Well, the situation starts to become complicated where organizations build a ridiculously big flow that's supposed to handle everything. You've got to perform regression testing on the entire flow after every single update, creating way more technical debt. You may want to consider splitting the flow down. This may feel a little like splitting up the fellowship of the flows, but it's a sensible choice at this stage. At this point, you need to make a business decision. How are we going to split this off? For example, there may be different business units that will want ownership over their own automation. And as the admin, you would liaise with all of these different business units. As of the Spring 22 release, you can set the order in which record triggered flows should fire. In a way, one flow per object has transitioned to X flows per object plus suddenly trigger order. This has helped make multiple flows per object a more feasible and generally preferred approach. If your business outgrows the rule of three, you should assess this together as a business and plan for a way forward that makes use of the entry criteria and flow trigger order. Understanding flow best practices is one thing, but it's also just as important to understand what you shouldn't do. Right, Tim? For sure. Let's start with the workflow to flow migration tool. You could say that it goes against the grain of having one flow per object, as this tool creates a one for one. If you've got 100 workflow rules that have existed in Salesforce for the longest time, using the migration tool means that you'll suddenly have 100 flows. This isn't ideal. 
For example, if you have 20 workflow rules that all send email alerts at different stages of an opportunity and another 30 workflow rules that update fields on the opportunity, you'd be better off creating a single record triggered flow that encompasses all of this functionality at once. This approach aligns closely with the one flow rule and also gives your business an opportunity to weed out older actions that don't make sense anymore and add any new ones in. It's essentially a rebuild and enhance approach rather than copy and paste. Organizations that are most at risk are businesses that have used Salesforce for a long time and or haven't had a consistent Salesforce resource. With no one to assess what's already there, there won't be anyone to decide on the best way to redesign it. What they would probably do is to use the migration tool, one button click and everything migrates across. So migrate to flow and away you go. Suddenly, you've got hundreds of flows where actually maybe four or five flows could do the job. Automation is the beating heart of Salesforce. I mean, really, what would we do without it? Automation is also a super important part of Flow's capabilities, but the setup process might not be as straightforward as you think. Some thought is required. Whether you're building new flows or moving other types of automation across to Flow, you've got to plan with the long term in mind rather than building flows that solve the requirement you have right now, but won't be able to accommodate future requirements. It also depends on the history of your Salesforce org. For example, if you're going straight from workflow rule to flows, you will be further behind than organizations that have been using Process Builder or Apex. Salesforce have recently performed some enhancements to the structure of flows. They've allowed admins and developers to set a lot more of the key properties from within the start element, which is the green element at the beginning of all flows, containing key information about the flow and how it should begin. So if you want to have both a before creator update and an after creator update, you can't handle these both inside the same flow. You'll also need a separate flow to handle deleted records, but remember that delete flows are always run before with no option to run after. The way Flow Builder has been designed means that each flow starts with one single trigger condition, either before creator update, after creator update, or before delete. Unlike Apex, which can support multiple contexts in a single trigger, a separate flow is required for each of these. Moving from Process Builder to Flow will also come with its migration considerations. While the single trigger condition, i.e. only before update or create, or after update or create, or before delete, is similar to Process Builder, you couldn't separate befores and afters, whereas you can in Flow, a feature that adds a huge amount of value. For now, I'd recommend the rebuild and enhance approach rather than using Salesforce's eventual migration tool to copy and paste. So now that we have all this knowledge under our belts, we can start to think about creating a foolproofed record triggered flow strategy. As you've heard, there are two main methods for creating record triggered flows within your org. Option one utilizes the entry criteria and flow trigger explorer to make it easier to manage multiple smaller flows, which will lead to performance improvements, particularly in orgs with large data volumes. Option two follows the rule of three, this approach is still endorsed by Salesforce themselves in certain circumstances, depending on your license and what your business needs are. It follows a number of best practices that are well known beyond even the realm of flow. Your business will need to assess what the best approach is for your specific use case when deciding which approach you're gonna use. Ideally, you should stick to just one of these options so that other flow developers who work on your org in the future don't get justifiably frustrated. If your business is going to follow the rule of three for accounts and contacts, do it for opportunities, cases, and custom objects as well. If you're planning to create multiple smaller flows that only intake a subset of information, don't also have a main flow that holds a majority of the flow functionality for an object. Keep your designs uniform across the board. And there we have it. The answer to how many flows you should have per object. The answer isn't as simple as the question sounds, right? Ultimately, how you approach this will depend on your business and its requirements, but there definitely is more than one option out there for you. At the end of the day, remember that bad data in means bad data out, and the same goes for automations. A massive thank you to Tim Combridge, who has been the brains behind this video. In case you haven't already, be sure to check out his full posts on this, linked in the description below.